afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful spring day for those of you that are in the Boston area. Um, I'm sure everyone would rather be outdoors, but hopefully we'll make this worth your while. So today, Dr. Kelly Hedgepeth and I are going to talk about atrial fibrillation and high blood pressure. So I'm going to start, do half an hour on atrial fibrillation, and then Dr. Kelly Hedgepeth is going to do half an hour on hypertension, and as we always do, we'll sort of interrupt each other and chime in. And as we always do, we're going to answer the questions that were submitted ahead of time, but we also invite you to submit questions as we go along into the Q&A. Um, and before we start, we just wanted to get a sense of who in the audience has had these conditions. So Allie, can you go ahead and launch those polls? So we're going to put up a poll asking, have you ever had atrial fibrillation? Yes, no, or not sure. So go ahead and click on that. Great. Okay, so we can release that. I know everyone doesn't have a chance to do this, um, but of those of you who voted, okay, great. So over 50% have had atrial fibrillation. That's really helpful for us to know. And I'm sure some of you who haven't have had loved ones or friends who've had it. Okay, good to know. And then for the second poll, we're going to ask about high blood pressure. So go ahead and launch that one. And thanks to Allie and Sydney behind the scenes here. So in the, the yes to high blood pressure is even if it's under good control. So have you had high blood pressure or been treated for high blood pressure? And this, as we know, I mean, both these conditions are so common, but high blood pressure even more common than atrial fibrillation. Okay, good. Really helpful. Thank you for voting. We can release that. So uh, over two thirds of you have had high blood pressure. Okay, excellent. All right, then I'm gonna share my screen and we will get started. So atrial fibrillation uh, is the most common abnormal heart rhythm across the world. And it gets more and more common as people get older. And it is usually associated with some type of structural heart disease, meaning some type of abnormality in the heart itself. And the common denominator with atrial fibrillation is that it usually is something that puts a stress on the atria, which are the upper heart chambers. So as you know, there's four heart chambers the two atria, the right and left atrium, are the upper chambers, and they squeeze first. And then the two lower chambers are the ventricles, and they squeeze next. And normally, there is a sequence where the atria squeeze and then the ventricles squeeze. And that's a, a normal sinus rhythm, a sequential, mechanically efficient contraction. But in atrial fibrillation, usually because of some type of abnormality of the atria, either they're under more pressure, they've got more stretch and more volume, there's some type of metabolic irritation, the atria don't contract in a normal, synchronized, efficient way, and you get atrial fibrillation. So the kinds of things that can cause that would be hypertensive heart disease from longstanding hypertension. It's not just that you might have high blood pressure off and on now and then, but if it's longstanding, long enough that the ventricle gets thickened, and we call that left ventricular hypertrophy, that also puts more pressure on the atria, especially the left atrium, and the atria can get enlarged, and that can predispose to atrial fibrillation. So longstanding hypertension is a major risk factor and probably the most common risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Uh, congestive heart failure, so when the heart muscle is weak and it can't contract normally, or when it's very stiff and it doesn't relax normally, that predisposes to atrial fibrillation. Leaky heart valve, like mitral valve regurgitation or leaking mitral valve, leaking tricuspid valve. So any of the valves that leak can make the atria stretch out and can predispose to AFib. Obstructive sleep apnea is a huge one. That's a really common one. And often we make the diagnosis of sleep apnea after we make the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So anytime we see someone with new atrial fibrillation, our minds start to think as cardiologists, what could be causing this? And if we don't have someone with high blood pressure or congestive heart failure or leaky valves, we'll always test for obstructive sleep apnea. So someone should always be tested for that when a new diagnosis of otherwise 
unexplained atrial fibrillation is made. Uh, another really common cause is lung disease. So someone who might have COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or emphysema, or asthma, or recurrent uh, pneumonias, recurrent blood clots in the lung, all those things put pressure on the right atrium and the right side of the heart, and they can cause atrial fibrillation also. And then less common, atrial fibrillation can run in the family. It can be a genetic tendency that's really rare. Over 90% of AFib is not familial. And because it's so common, many of us have parents, grandparents, uncles who have had atrial fibrillation. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're at higher risk if you had a parent with atrial fibrillation, especially if that parent had one of these other conditions, like that parent had long-standing high blood pressure or a leaky valve or obstructive sleep apnea, that's probably why that person had AFib rather than a genetic predisposition. The genetic types of atrial fibrillation tend to come on very early in people in their 20s or 30s, as opposed to the other types of AFib that tend to come on later in life, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So the genetic type is rare, but it does happen. I have a family where all three siblings had atrial fibrillation in their 20s and 30s, and both parents have had it. <laughs> Um, electrolyte abnormalities like low potassium can predispose, and thyroid abnormalities, especially high thyroid, hyperthyroid, those can all cause atrial fibrillation. The list does go on, and there are other causes, but these would be some of the most common causes of atrial fibrillation. So, and what about symptoms? So some people have atrial fibrillation, and they don't feel anything different at all. They're completely asymptomatic. And it might be diagnosed just because you're at a routine doctor's office and someone's listening to your heart or feeling your pulse and noticing that it's irregular. And then they get an electrocardiogram or an EKG and they find atrial fibrillation. That's maybe 20, 30% of patients have, have no symptoms or really minimal symptoms. At the other end of the spectrum, some people are highly symptomatic, very bothered by their atrial fibrillation. And I've written down some things that I've heard my patients say, and they say, it's a skip beat, it's a fluttering in my chest, it's irregular, it's a fish flopping around. Uh, some people don't feel this at all in the chest, but might say, I notice that every time I try to go upstairs, I get really short of breath, or every time I try to exercise, I can't. When I'm in atrial fibrillation, I feel like I'm breathless. Uh, other people feel a very fast racing heartbeat. Rarely do people get chest discomfort or angina, but we do see that, especially in people who have known narrowing or blockages in the heart arteries, and then they go into atrial fibrillation. That's not uncommon. And then sometimes atrial fibrillation can occur and it can cause low blood pressure, which can lead to dizziness or lightheadedness. So again, some, sometimes people have no symptoms or very mild, subtle symptoms, other people know the second they went in and they feel it and it's unmistakable. So on the one hand, people are lucky if they don't feel the AFib, but on the other hand, as doctors, it's helpful for us if somebody does know their symptoms and then they can say, yes, it started at four in the morning and it went away at 10.55, um, but not everybody can, can feel their symptoms in that way. Um, so what is atrial fibrillation? So it's, as I was mentioning, it's an abnormal heart rhythm that starts in those upper heart chambers in the atria. And when you have atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers are contracting very quickly, 400 to 600 beats per minute, and they're not contracting in a normal synchronized way. So in normal rhythm, you have a little internal pacemaker in the upper heart chambers that tells the heart when to beat. And it tells the heart to beat in a synchronized organized way, usually between 60 and 100 beats a minute faster if there is adrenaline and norepinephrine and you're exercising, slower when you're sleeping, but the typical range in normal rhythm is going to be about 60 to 100 beats per minute. In atrial fibrillation, on the other hand, the heart rate tends to be quite a bit faster, and typically in older people, they might go 100 to 120 beats a minute. Young people tend to go 160 to 180 beats a minute. So the atria are going 400 to 600 beats a minute, sort of quivering like this, and the ventricles, the lower chambers, are beating you know, around 100, 120 beats a minute. The ventricle beat, that's the beat that you feel if you're checking someone's pulse is the ventricle beat, um, is typically fast and is the rate that determines what you feel and if you have symptoms or not. So everyone in AFib has very, very fast atria and doesn't really feel that. 
what you feel is the lower chambers, the ventricles, beating fast and irregularly. Usually atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means that it comes and goes. It starts and stops on its own. So when you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you may, may be in normal rhythm much, much of the time, and then for reasons that may or may not be triggered by something identifiable, you go into atrial fibrillation and you come back out of it. So that's paroxysmal. A common pattern, but not always, is that someone may have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation initially, so maybe once every four to six weeks, every couple months, have a fib, and then it may get more and more frequent and then may eventually be permanent so that someone's in atrial fibrillation 24 seven. Other people just go into permanent atrial fibrillation and stay there. So again, the symptoms vary and also how often someone's in AFib can vary. So this is a nice picture that sort of shows you how the heart electrical work looks different in AFib versus normal rhythm. So over on the left, the normal heart rhythm, there is a pacemaker in your right atrium called the sinoatrial node, and that's the one that initiates a normal heartbeat. And it tells the right and left atrium to beat, and then from the AV node, that signal is taken down to the lower chambers. And so you get a sequential contraction of the upper and then the lower chambers. And if you were to do an electrocardiogram on somebody in normal sinus rhythm, it would look like this. You have the upper chambers over here, lower chambers over here, repolarized. Upper chambers, lower chambers, repolarized. And it would be very regular. Atrial fibrillation, on the other hand, you have multiple of these little pacemakers, hundreds of them, and they're usually coming from the left atrium. So over in this chamber, and they're telling the heart to beat, 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 beat. And so as a result, the heart is, the atria are beating from all these different places in this chaotic, what we call bag of worms appearance. It looks like this squirming bag of worms. And then the AV node tries to take that signal down to the ventricles as fast as it can keep up. And fortunately, it can't keep up with 400 beats a minute, but it can keep up with 100 to 140 beats a minute. And what you see on an electrocardiogram in atrial fibrillation is the, each one of these is the ventricles beating. These big ones are the ventricles beating, and that's where you'd feel your pulse. The little line down here, that's the atria beating. So the atria are beating very, very fast and irregular, and the ventricles, the pulse rate, is going to be also fast and irregular, um, and that's where you'd feel the pulse might go boom, 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 like that. So it's irregular, and it's fast. So again, just another way to show that is the normal rhythm is the upper chambers, lower chambers, upper chambers, lower chambers, upper chambers, lower chambers. In contrast, in atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers are just going crazy and the lower chambers are going irregularly irregular. Okay, so how is atrial fibrillation detected? Well, if you have symptoms that feel like any of those palpitations we talked about, it might be atrial fibrillation. It might be something else altogether. Some of you may have had something called PVCs, which is premature ventricular complexes, where it's coming from the lower chamber, or you might have something called atrial flutter. There's lots of different rhythms and lots of different things that can cause palpitations, flopping, skipping, etc. So as cardiologists, our job is to figure out what rhythm is causing these symptoms or what rhythm is causing this irregularity because we would treat atrial fibrillation very differently, for example, than we would treat PVCs. So we want to get an EKG and monitor you when you're having those symptoms. So of course we'll do an electrocardiogram in the office, but that's just a 10 second snapshot of your heart rhythm. It's very possible that you have atrial fibrillation off and on, this paroxysmal AFib, but when you're sitting in the office, you might be in the normal rhythm and a normal EKG in the office doesn't tell me what's going on you know, at three in the morning when you're having those palpitations. So typically what we do is we wanna give somebody something to take home with them, a heart monitor that can monitor the heart rhythm when they're not in the office. So monitor the heart rhythm for a long enough stretch of time that we can catch this irregular rhythm and see exactly what it is. So some of those are heart monitors that we give people or we're seeing now people who have an Apple iWatch 
the Apple Watches, some of the newer ones can detect atrial fibrillation and alert you and notify you if they think that you're having an irregular rhythm suggesting AFib. And the Cardia app, which some of you may have seen, is a little machine you can buy that costs about $100 and pairs to a smartphone. And you put your fingers on it, and I'll show you a picture to see if what you're having is consistent with AFib. So again, the heart monitors might be a patch monitor like this that you wear. It's sort of like a big Band-Aid on the chest. And typically, people wear that for five to seven days and mail it in. These portable monitors, either a Holter or a, what we call an MCT, a mobile cardiac telemetry, attached to a machine. And that's a continuous monitor as well. These are the Apple Watch uh, types that can look for AFib. And then this is what that Cardia smartphone app looks like. Uh, the nice thing about the Cardia is if you buy this and you have it on hand all the time, uh, you're more likely to catch it because these monitors are usually maximum 30 days, more often 5 to 7 or 14 days. And if you don't have the heart rhythm during that time, you know, Murphy's Law is you turn your monitor in and the next day you get those palpitations, but you don't have the monitor anymore. So something you can have at home like this Cardia app is really nice. and. We ask our patients, if you have that app and you get AFib, and some of you out there in the audience have done this, you can email us your strips and we can look at it and say, yep, that might be AFib, or nope, that's definitely not AFib. So these are really useful. And same with the Apple Watches, they can keep track of this. Okay, so as cardiologists, how do we evaluate atrial fibrillation? The first time we diagnose it, what we wanna do is look for a reversible cause of AFib. Is there something triggering that AFib that we can treat and revert you back to normal. So for example, we might do an echocardiogram to look for leaky heart valves, to look for an enlarged heart, et cetera. We would order a sleep study to look for obstructive sleep apnea. We'll do a heart monitor to see if in fact this is atrial fibrillation. How often is it happening? Are you feeling every episode of AFib or might there also be some silent atrial fibrillation where you don't realize but you're in it? And then we can measure in, say, in an average week or two weeks, how much of the time are you in atrial fibrillation. So the monitors are really useful. How fast does the atrial fibrillation go? Does it slow down when you snap in and out of AFib? A lot of things that monitor tells us about what's going on when you're at home living your life and not in the office. We would also typically do blood tests to look for anything like hyperthyroid. Is the thyroid too high or overactive? Do you have electrolyte problems such as a low potassium? Sometimes people who take diuretics or water pills lose potassium in the urine and low potassium can predispose to atrial fibrillation. So there's a set of things that we would always automatically do when someone comes in with atrial fibrillation. Then no matter what the cause is, we're gonna recommend healthy lifestyle changes. So for some people, stress can really precipitate atrial fibrillation. And many of you, again, know who you are, that when you have an extraordinarily stressful day or a really bad night of sleep, or for some people, jet lag, or too much caffeine, Sudafed, anything that's stimulating, adrenaline, caffeine, can trigger atrial fibrillation in some people. So we really wanna look at that, examine that, what seems to precipitate the atrial fibrillation, and can we reduce that? Um, Exercise in general can help reduce atrial fibrillation and it's not contraindicated at all. In fact, we recommend it and then we recommend it as a way to keep the heart healthy, to keep the blood pressure healthy, to help burn off all that adrenaline. And in addition, maintaining a healthy weight, healthy eating habits, healthy sleeping habits can also help in a lot of people to reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation. And then as I mentioned, if you can identify your triggers for AFib and avoid them, that's ideal. So for some people, it is caffeine. For a lot of people, caffeine makes no difference. But I had a patient who could drink two cups of coffee a day, but every time he went to a third cup, he'd go into atrial fibrillation. He doesn't need to give up coffee altogether, but he should avoid that third cup, right? Same thing with alcohol. Sometimes one glass of wine a night is fine, but when it's two or three, that's when the atrial fibrillation comes on, and it might come on in the middle of the night. So being really aware, keeping a symptom diary, writing down, is it totally random when the AFib comes on or could there possibly be a relationship to X, Y, or Z? And if it's a relationship to alcohol or caffeine or stress, what can we do to reduce that trigger?
And then once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat atrial fibrillation? Well, there's three main things we want to do. Slow down the heart rate when it's too fast. Prevent stroke, because when the atria are beating asynchronously, you get stagnant blood flow and can make little blood clots that can break loose and go to the brain. So control the heart rate, prevent stroke, and then control the heart rhythm and try to keep someone in normal rhythm if there's symptoms. So going into each of those, so controlling the heart rate if it's too fast, atrial fibrillation tends to be inappropriately fast heart rate. So whereas if you're in normal rhythm, you might be normally running a heart rate in the 60s or 70s, with atrial fibrillation, you might typically be running in the 120s, 130s. The heart doesn't like to go that fast for no good reason for hours and hours and days and days at a time. So we slow it down. And typically the medicines we use to slow down the heart rate are called beta blockers. That's the tenolol, metoprolol, natolol, everything that ends in olol, those are the beta blockers. Calcium blockers like diltiazem and verapamil, those are the calcium blockers, and then digoxin. And sometimes we use a combination of those three medicines. So slow the heart rate with a medicine to slow it down. Prevent stroke, usually with a blood thinner. So there's a, a calculation I'll show you where we say, what is your risk of having a stroke in the next year if you have atrial fibrillation and you're not on a blood thinner? And if that likelihood is more than one or 2% per year, then we consider blood thinners to reduce that risk of stroke. Uh, the blood thinners we used to use were always Coumadin or Warfarin, and a lot of people are still on that drug, but it can be, for those of you who've been on it, or who've known someone on it, a little bit inconvenient. Coumadin or warfarin, it interacts with vitamin K, so foods that have vitamin K, like green vegetables, can cause the INR to go up and down. And Coumadin can interact with antibiotics and other things. So it, you have to get your blood monitored, you gotta adjust your dose frequently. So the newer medicines, it'll be called the direct anticoagulants, like Eliquis, Pradaxa, Xarelto, those are the newer ones. So any of those are considered good blood thinners to help prevent stroke in atrial fibrillation. For people who cannot go on a blood thinner, either because they're at risk of a major bleed, like a major bleeding ulcer or recent major surgery, or for whatever reason, they cannot take a blood thinner, there's a um, device called a Watchman, which is a little mesh plug that they can put in through, usually they go in through the artery in the leg, and they plug up something called the atrial appendage, which is where the blood clots tend to form. And it's not something that we recommend in everybody, but there are some people who are eligible for that, and it helps reduce the likelihood of making a blood clot inside the left atrium. It's not perfect, and it's an invasive procedure, um, but in certain cases it's better than uh, safer than a blood thinner. As far as controlling the rhythm, uh, we have a lot of medicines that we use, and some of you may have been on something called a pill in the pocket, and other medicines are taken every day. So there's antiarrhythmic medicines or rhythm controlling medicines that you might carry with you and only take it when you get atrial fibrillation. And then typically they make the atrial fibrillation go away within 30 to 60 minutes. So that's medicines like propranolol. Um, fleconide are medicines that would control the atrial fibrillation, and you don't have to take them every day, just when you get the AFib. But for some people, they have so much atrial fibrillation, or that strategy doesn't work, and they take a suppressing medicine every day to suppress the AFib in the first place. So there's different ways to do it, and you talk to your cardiologist to figure out what makes sense for you, depending on how often you have AFib, how long it lasts, how bothersome it is. Once in a while, AFib lasts days and days at a time, and we have to actually do electrical cardioversion to get you out of it. And that's when we bring you into the Brigham and Women's Hospital. The anesthesiologist puts you to sleep just for a few seconds, and we use an electric paddle to shock your heart back into rhythm. That may work getting you back into normal rhythm, and for most people it does, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you stay in the normal rhythm. In rare cases, we may do an ablation where we ablate uh, by using high frequency ultrasound, the source of the atrial fibrillation. Um, and that is effective 50 to 75% of the time. Some people need to come back and get it done again. And then there's also sometimes where we put a pacemaker in uh, and ablate the whole connection between the upper and lower chambers. 
So there's lots of options, and it really depends on how bothered you are by the symptoms of AFib, whether or not you can take medications to get rid of it, whether those medicines work, et cetera. So lots of strategies that would involve trying to get you back in normal rhythm. Sometimes we opt to let people stay in AFib. As I said, some people are in AFib 24 seven and they tolerate it fine. And as long as we can keep the heart rate from going too fast and we can put you on a blood thinner to prevent a stroke, it's a completely reasonable option for many people. So this is just what doctors use. You don't need to know this obviously, but it's something called a CHAD score that helps us decide what is your risk of having a stroke if you don't go on a blood thinner. So we take into account things like congestive heart failure, hypertension or high blood pressure, older age, the presence of diabetes, the presence of a previous stroke, the presence of vascular disease like peripheral arterial disease or coronary artery disease, and female sex. And you get a point or two for each of those and then let's say you are a 75 year old woman with diabetes. You get two points for being 75, a point for being a woman and a point for being diabetic. That would be a score of four. And then you come over here, you say, if my score is four, then I have a 4% risk of having a stroke in the next year if I don't take a blood thinner. And if I take a blood thinner, that risk comes down to one or 2%. So again, we, we calculate your score. We calculate your risk of bleeding. We talk with you about whether or not you're willing to take a blood thinner. Do you have any risk of bleeding or high risk hobbies like mountain biking in the middle of nowhere? And we weigh the risk and we weigh the benefit of a blood thinner and then we come up with a best plan. And this is again from the American Journal of Cardiology, the, the guidelines that we as cardiologists use to control rate. So we might use calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, digitalis, amiodarone, et cetera. We try to maintain sinus rhythm, meaning maintain normal rhythm, either with drugs, and those are the rhythm controlling drugs we talked about, or with procedures, like doing that ablation or pacemakers. And then we try to prevent strokes. So with medications that are blood thinners, including Pradaxa, Pixaban, Debigatran, that's the Eliquis, the Xarelto, et cetera, Warfarin. Aspirin alone, unfortunately, is not sufficient to prevent stroke. It really doesn't do much at all. So we don't really use that as, as a preventive. Um, and then that Watchman device, which is an isolation of the left atrial appendage, that little, like a little appendix in the atrium to help prevent uh, a blood clot from forming. So again, it really depends on the person. It depends on what their heart looks like. It depends on their symptoms. And then we might use medicines like ACE inhibitors and other things to help prevent the long-term sequelae of atrial fibrillation. So that's a lot of information and I will pause here, but to summarize, AFib is really common. It affects up to 20% of people as we hit our 80s. Um, symptoms can range from nothing to severe and disabling. Uh, when you're evaluated, we always wanna look for a, rever a reversible cause and treat a reversible cause uh, when possible. And for treatment, we always wanna make sure that the lifestyle is as healthy as can be. We identify and then avoid triggers and then we use medicine to slow the heart rate, we try to prevent stroke, and we may or may not try to control the rhythm. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and let's see what kinds of questions we have. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dara. So much great information there. Um, you know, I think it is when you get that initial diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, it is potentially overwhelming because there's just so many topics to cover to kind of get your head around what this means. And I really try to uncouple the symptoms from the stroke management because those are quite often two different yes. conversations, right? So I, I, I know that there's a number of questions that people are asking about the role of the ablation and... Mm -hmm. Most of the treatments, you know, that we're reaching for are really focusing on symptoms, right? So um, maybe you want to just repeat, you know, your approach to somebody has symptoms from atrial fibrillation. How, how would you end up at an ablation? Okay, great. So usually we try to avoid invasive procedures if we can, but some recent data suggests that we wait too long before turning to an ablation. And ablation, so there's, there's two kinds of ablation, so I wanna just be clear on that. One is what we call PVI, which is pulmonary vein isolation. That one is where the electrophysiologist would go in in a procedure that takes a few hours and find with a little catheter 
the left atrial spots around where the pulmonary veins enter and scar them up and create four little scars in the left atrium to isolate the pulmonary veins because that's where atrial fibrillation usually starts. Now, this, as I said, it can take a few hours to get this done. It is invasive. It involves going through the arteries. Uh, those are the downsides. And then it's about 50 to 70% effective. If it's effective, then it, after the first month or two, which can actually get a little worse before they get better, after the first few months, if it's effective, it has either completely abolished atrial fibrillation, so it abolishes all the symptoms that go with it, or it's reduced it substantially so that it happens less often, and when it happens, it snaps out of it more quickly. So that sometimes we can get people off some of their medications, and the medications themselves can have side effects. So pulmonary vein isolation, if someone has a structurally normal heart on an echocardiogram, meaning we look at an ultrasound of the heart and the heart chambers are pretty normal in size and the valves are working pretty well and there's nothing structurally really wrong with that heart, they're more likely to succeed with an ablation. Um, if someone has a really enlarged upper heart chamber, really big atria, really leaky valves, those people are more likely to fall into the category that does not succeed. So if you don't succeed with an ablation, what that means is about 25 to 50% of people get this procedure and they still have AFib. Um, so then it doesn't do any good at all, right? There, there's another type of procedure which is much more invasive and more uh, dramatic, which is that we completely interrupt the connection between the upper and lower heart chambers. And this is called an AV node ablation. So you interrupt that connection between the upper and lower and you put in a pacemaker and now that person is 100% dependent on the pacemaker to tell their heart when to beat. So we have to be very careful to make sure that battery doesn't run out and we watch that. And that solves the problem of very fast atrial fibrillation in people for whom medicines fail and ablation fails and everything else fails. It can really be a game changer and help reduce the symptoms of that fluttering very fast heart rate. And it also allows you to come off of the beta blockers and the calcium blockers. You still need to be in a blood thinner if you have this kind of ablation because the atria are still in atrial fibrillation with this kind of ablation. It's just that the ventricles, the lower chambers, aren't responding to it. So there's pulmonary vein isolation, which is 50 to 75 percent effective, and when it's effective, it gets people 100 percent or mostly out of AFib, may or may not need a second procedure. And then there's pacemaker and AV node ablation, which is the dramatic one that gives you guaranteed no more of that very fast heart rate, but your pacemaker is dependent. That's a great overview. And, um, you know, again, so much of our treatment options are based on your symptoms and how you're doing. So if you have a history of atrial fibrillation and you are having symptoms once a year, guess what? Your treatment is working and you don't need to feel like, oh gosh, am I missing something? Is there a window I have to do an ablation and I'll be cured? Definitely not. The, the ablations and the and the role of pacemakers um, are, are really to focus on symptoms that we can't get under control with simple medications. Um, now, we also really encourage people um, to do that deep dive into some of the lifestyle factors as we're trying to get their symptoms under control. So, you know, we're addressing their stroke risk, we're using medication to control their symptoms, but there's actually a huge role for lifestyle intervention. Um, so in the past year, we've been, um, we've received updates that are um, from the American Heart Association, really encouraging us um, to be screening for sleep apnea. Um, as Dara touched on, if your oxygen is low at night, that's a huge trigger for ongoing cardiac remodeling and is really going to propagate and promote atrial fibrillation. So we want to know about that. The other thing is being overweight or obese really triggers cardiac remodeling that predisposes you to atrial fibrillation. So sometimes losing either five or 10 pounds really reduces the risk that you're gonna have ongoing symptoms, those palpitation symptoms related to atrial fibrillation. So there really is um, a lot in our control. And then the other big preventative piece is exercise. And those patients that do have um, symptoms from atrial fibrillation, if you exercise regularly, you're much less likely to have ongoing symptoms. So as we're you know, putting together the pieces of a treatment plan, we really wanna be focusing on some of these interventions that 
you know, you can be doing on a daily basis that will really um, decrease your overall, overall risk. Um, there's some other questions here about clots, blood clots, predisposition to blood clots like factor V Leiden and how that factors in. You want to give us maybe a, a quick overview again of just how you take into account who needs blood, blood thinners and uh, what would, would push you to put people on blood thinners. Okay. So, so that CHAD score that I showed you doesn't apply necessarily to factor V lighting. It applies to everybody. So certain things make you more likely to have a blood clot and certain things make you more likely to have a stroke. So factor V lighting is a genetic tendency to make blood clots based on a, a clotting factor that is abnormally present in your bloodstream. So it does contribute to the possibility of stroke if you're already in AFib. It doesn't contribute to AFib, but if you're in AFib and that's one of the factors you have, we would tend to be a little more aggressive about putting you on a blood thinner. So very rarely people with atrial fibrillation have a CHAD score of zero. Um, that would be a young, healthy, man with no diabetes, no hypertension, no valve problems, et cetera. And those people don't need to be on a blood thinner because the small risk of blood thinner outweighs the small risk of a stroke. But pretty much everybody else uh, is going to fall into the category where the benefit of the blood thinner outweighs the stroke and factor V Leiden just contributes a little more to that risk of forming the blood clot in the first place. Um, but treatment isn't necessarily different. Uh, but if you were a young, healthy man who otherwise had a CHAD score of zero and you weren't going to be on a blood thinner and you had factor V Leiden, that might be one of the only cases I can think of where an aspirin would make sense. Um, but it's not really, it doesn't really change the equation. Um, and does AV node ablation require, oh, so someone was asking about a maze procedure. AV node ablation is not open heart surgery. It's typically done in the electrophysiology lab where they go in through a catheter in the leg and burn out that AV node. Maze procedure, if someone is having open heart surgery for another reason, say for a mitral valve surgery or something like that, while they're in there, the surgeon can do something similar to a pulmonary vein isolation, but they do it looking right at your heart with a little gun that does high frequency ultrasound. So um, normally we don't do open heart surgery just to do this isolation or ablation, but if you're going in for open heart surgery anyway, the surgeon will do it at that time. But I want to make sure, Allison, that you have time to talk about high blood pressure. So I'll start typing in some answers to the AFib questions as you talk, and then we'll see what we have time for at the end. Let me, let me share my screen because I, I do think um, AFib and blood pressure issues go hand in hand. So this is why we kind of um, grouped these two lectures together because, as Dara said, worldwide, high blood pressure is the number one cause of atrial fibrillation. So, and high blood pressure, um, as um, our audience knows, is really quite common. So we had a lot of the people listening that report that they have high blood pressure and that's really reflective in the American population. So um, I'm showing you this first slide just because um, we have updated guidelines to help guide us in the treatment and management of hypertension. So the most current guidelines were published in 2017, so about five years ago, um, and agreed upon by multiple professional organizations, okay? Um, so what is your blood pressure? So your heart pumps, right? Your heart beats, and that's gonna generate um, a, a pulse of blood to, um, that's delivered through tubes, arteries, um, that go all over our body. Uh, to deliver oxygen and nutrients to all of our organs and all our cells in the body. So when the heart contracts, that causes um, an increase in your blood pressure, and that's the systolic number, the top number, the higher one. And then um, in between the heart contractions, we measure the pressure that's the residual pressure left in the tube, the artery, and that's the diastolic pressure. So the top number is systolic, and the bottom number is diastolic. And when you go see your physician, your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, they should be measuring your blood pressure um, and giving you a number. And based on that number, hopefully they're characterizing you whether you have a normal blood pressure or an abnormal blood pressure. So in these 2017 uh, guideline updates, we're actually a little more stringent than what we considered uh, high blood pressure or hypertension to be in the past. So normal or optimal blood pressure is less than 120 and less than 80. 
Um, so I frequently get questions from patients. Oh my gosh, my blood pressure was 110. Is that too low? And I say, woohoo, that is a great number. That is exactly where we want you to be for, for most people. There are situations where you might have symptoms. You know, if you're used to being at 180 um, and we bring you down uh, to 110, you, you might feel that. Um, so gradually over time is how we like to make changes. But in general, lower is better as far as blood pressure and cardiovascular risk goes. So when the blood pressure is between 120 and 129, um, on the top number, the systolic, that's considered elevated. And um, we want to be watching that, working on lifestyle interventions, and in some cases, titrating medications. Certainly, when your blood pressure is above 130, um, we're really concerned now that you have early uh, stage one hypertension and will benefit not only from lifestyle interventions, but also from medications. And when that top number is greater than 140, that's stage two hypertension. Um, so why do we care about your blood pressure, right? Well, most people, if your blood pressure is high, don't know it, right? So this is different from atrial fibrillation where we're really focused on your symptoms, right? Hypertension is known as the silent killer because usually um, people don't feel off. Um, there are, of course, some people that are really sensitive to having high blood pressure and can really tell if they've done something or had a really anxiety-provoking day and they think their blood pressure is up, but most people don't feel it. Um, that constant pressure leading to our organ systems, though, does result in cellular damage, which over time can really predispose to some serious medical conditions. So obviously, um, blood pressure uh, in the vessels leading to the brain can cause a stroke. Um, in changes uh, related to high blood pressure in the eyes can result in um, change in your vision. Um, the blood, um, the uh, coronary arteries, which are the blood supply to the heart, um, can be really affected by the sheer stress of high blood pressure, which can propagate clot burden, and that can result in a heart attack. And then the actual heart muscle can remodel as it pumps against a high pressure system and that causes heart failure. Um, uh, there were some questions about heart failure um, that people have asked and that sometimes does go hand in hand with high blood pressure um, because the same way you would lift weights um, with your arm and your bicep would get bigger related to that weight, your heart can remodel and get thicker as it's pumping against the high blood pressure. And that can result in heart failure. It also causes a big stretch on the top chamber of the heart, the atria, and, um, and that's why it can really lead to atrial arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation. Uh, the vessels leading to the kidneys can also um, be affected by living with high blood pressure and can result in uh, kidney damage. And quite often we do see evidence after you've had high blood pressure for a number of years that the kidneys are actually um, affected by that. And sometimes that goes hand in hand with chronic hypertension. So in all these organ systems, I just like to remind everybody that on a cellular level, we're really seeing a lot of sophisticated um, cellular changes, um, and that affects the way cells grow, the way cells communicate with each other, um, and um, uh, can, can really, um, once a little damage is done, then a lot of damage can be propagated. So I'm not going to go through um, all the sophisticated details of this uh, slide, but it's one of those things that a little high blood pressure sometimes leads to remodeling that affects the integrity of the vessel walls and then propagates further high blood pressure. So as with most things that we really try to highlight and talk about here, prevention is really an important aspect of treating blood pressure. Um, uh, and controlling all the things that can help to keep your blood pressure stable over decades so we're not dealing with any of the end organ consequences. Okay, so this is a, a very busy slide, but I highlighted the boxes that um, I think are really interesting and I hope um, everybody can uh, remember at the end of this talk. Um, this is data from a large um, longitudinal study called the end Hain study that has studied over 10,000 Americans uh, over 20 years. And 
this shows how prevalent the diagnosis of hypertension is because um, of the people enrolled in the study, over 46% reported a blood pressure over of 130, of greater than 130 over 80. And you can see where it's broken down by age group. Once you hit your 50s, right? 70% of men, 60% of women report high blood pressure. And that just goes up with each increasing decade. So um, preventing this, paying attention to your blood pressure and really talking to your uh, doctor about early intervention is so important. So uh, how do we measure your blood pressure? It's always good to start off with, um, with valid data before we make inter any interventions. And again, I'm just showing you the highlight from those 2017 guidelines because I think it's, it's nice for you to know what the official recommendations are. But um, we try to um, screen everybody for um, hypertension. And of course, we need accurate data to make that diagnosis. So we want, when we bring people into the office to really be um, rigorous with how we're documenting this and um, the equipment that we're using. Of course, in the office, the blood pressure cuffs have been validated and we know they're accurate. A lot of times we ask people to bring their home blood pressure cuff into the visit so we can make sure we're getting the same reading from the office cuff as you're getting from um, the home cuff. Um, and, and typically we like to document a couple blood pressures and take the average of them. And then we always like to encourage um, the patient to know what their blood pressure reading is, because I think um, an informed patient is a powerful patient. So um, if your doctor or nurse doesn't volunteer that information, you should always ask because you should know where your, your blood pressure is living. Um, these are some important steps um, in making sure that the blood pressure readings are accurate. And in a busy office, sometimes this doesn't always happen, but certainly if you have a cuff and you're monitoring your blood pressure at home, you should be striving to monitor it um, in this fashion. So you wanna be seated, relaxed, and ideally with your feet supported on the floor. Um, and you wanna be seated for at least five minutes. Um, this is an important because when you come into the office, sometimes we don't take it in the chair. We put you immediately on the exam table where your legs are dangling and your back's not supported and you might be uncomfortable. And sometimes that leads to high readings. So in an ideal setting, we really want you seated, relaxed, um, and, and have your back and your feet supported. We also uh, don't like to take the readings right after you finished exercise. So if you are monitoring your blood pressure at home for your doctor, um, doing it at rest is great, but not in um, the, the, the near rest period after you've exercised. Um, and ideally, um, you know, you'll be aware of the effects of caffeine and tobacco on your blood pressure as well, um, and um, take it at, at times when you're really substance free. Um, we, oops, we want to make sure that you're comfortable. So sometimes um, that means emptying your bladder before taking your blood pressure. All of our organ systems are certainly um, uh, integrated together. And sometimes having a full bladder is a big trigger for your blood pressure to go up. So we should be aware of that. Um, and, and ideally you won't be talking, you'll be um, resting while the blood pressure cuff um, is um, being inflated. And ideally that cuff will be right against your skin. Um, sometimes we do have to do it over a, a shirt, but it should really be um, a thin layer of clothing um, and ideally uh, no layer at all. The other thing that's really important is making sure you have the right cuff size. Um, so the, um, these are the centimeters size of your, of your bicep. Um, you can measure your arm to make sure you have the appropriate cuff. Um, uh, easier way is when you have the cuff on your arm, it should really cover 80% of your bicep. If the cuff is too small, your blood pressure readings are going to be inflated and uh, the readings um, will be falsely elevated. And if you have a, a cuff on that's too big, you're going to get a low reading. So the, the accurate cuff size is really important. And if there's a question, you should always ask um, at the doctor's office what size cuff they're using to make sure you have the same one um, on your home blood pressure monitoring cuff. Um, so with those caveats in mind, um, I, I like to show everyone this because it really is the official recommendation to also get out of the office blood pressure readings. And that's really important because sometimes the office setting is rushed. Sometimes you're very anxious because you've been sitting in traffic and late for your appointment and readings are high. Um, and 
uh, or, you know, there could be a million and one reasons. And sometimes we don't do it twice and take an average. So um, having home blood pressure readings is really critical. And then having a smattering of readings to review with your doctor is really, I think, the best way to um, recognize where your baseline blood pressure is so we can make accurate interventions. There are um, some causes of hypertension that I want to show um, here. In the majority of patients, when we're talking about high blood pressure, we're really talking about essential hypertension, which means we have not identified one reversible cause that if we fix it, your blood pressure issues will go away. Um, and that's because with essential hypertension, sometimes it is a lot of little things uh, as well as a genetic predisposition. Um, but when you see your physician, they'll do some really common laboratory work to rule out a lot of these things. Um, we always look at kidneys. A lot of times we're measuring um, renin and aldosterone, um, which are hormones that can be found in the blood. Um, and there is new recognized awareness of the association of high blood pressure and obstructive sleep apnea. So we're ordering a lot of sleep studies to evaluate for sleep apnea and also the effects of alcohol. So some people are very uh, sensitive um, to having alcohol in their diet and that can really drive up um, blood pressure readings. The other um, items listed on this page, I'm not going to go through all of them, but most of them um, are part of, a, of a, an initial workup for high blood pressure where we're doing a full physical examination, probably an ultrasound of the heart, an echocardiogram, um, and uh, blood pressure measurements in multiple extremities as well as uh, some laboratory tests. So uh, when you have a diagnosis of high blood pressure, um, usually we're going to be moving forward with a treatment that does include medication. Um, but it turns out that non-medication, non-pharmacologic interventions um, are really our first line treatment. Um, and and um, everyone that has a diagnosis of high blood pressure should be really invested in understanding these and making changes to their lifestyle. So I tried to highlight these in red, and these are things that we've talked about on this webinar multiple times. But again, these um, guidelines here are taken from um, the physician update. So I just wanna highlight how important they are. Um, weight loss is recommended um, if you have a diagnosis of elevated blood pressure to help control those numbers. Following a heart healthy diet, which um, I'll talk more about in a minute. Following the salt or the sodium in your diet is also um, sometimes important. And adding potassium to your diet is also um, can be helpful. And I'm going to uh, talk more about those in a second. Um, the other things on this list, increasing your physical activity, exercise, 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 and um, really being modest with your alcohol consumption. So this is a, a busy graph, but uh, I think it's really nice to see the intervention and the effect on blood pressure. And again, this table is taken right from those guidelines. So weight loss um, can reduce your blood pressure reading five millimeters of mercury on average, and you lose about, or you reduce your blood pressure about a millimeter of mercury for every kilogram of body weight you lose. So for every couple pounds, your blood pressure will go down. So um, that's a potentially huge um, benefit to your blood pressure, especially um, if you couple that with um, exercise and diet interventions. Now, the DASH diet, which is a diet very similar to the Mediterranean diet, which we've talked about in detail on this webinar, um, that's really promoting a diet mostly based in fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains and minimizing processed food. So those um, fresh vegetables are high in fiber and rich in potassium, which really has a big impact on people's blood pressure. And you can see here, um, on average can lower your blood pressure 11 millimeters of mercury, which is huge. And as much as um, initiating that first blood pressure medication. So being committed to that dietary um, part of treatment is really key. Um, we also like to have people be aware of the salt they, they take um, they ingest in their diet. Most of the sodium, the salt that we ingest is from the processed food in our diet. So if you're eating um, a really unprocessed diet full of fiber, 
um, and leafy green vegetables, which are high in potassium and minimizing that processed food, you probably are in an okay um, sodium range. There are a subset of people with high blood pressure that are really salt responsive. So for those people, it's really important um, to limit the salt shaker and um, to know the impact of salt on, um, on your blood pressure. So if you're one of these people that are salt sensitive, it um, is really gonna make a big difference when you decide to order takeout, right? You should um, have, a, have a goal, right? Or have a plan, right, of what you're gonna do if you take your blood pressure and it's sky high. Um, Part of that plan hopefully is limiting the, the takeout, but um, sometimes um, some of my patients know, gosh, if, if their blood pressure happened to be above this level, it's safe to go ahead and take an extra pill on those days. Um, but you have to do that with um, a partnership with your prescribing physician. Okay, um, it does look like we're getting um, light on time, so I'm gonna quickly go through these last slides, but I, I do wanna do, do justice to this exercise piece here because aerobic activity um, that we recommend for all of our patients, 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes a day can reduce blood pressure by five to eight millimeters of mercury. If you do strength training, additionally, you can get another decrease of about four millimeters of mercury in your blood pressure and doing isometric resistance training, which can be a hand grip exercise or holding a plank, can also have significant uh, reductions in your blood pressure. So if this is news to you, I really encourage everybody to explore adding that weight training component to your, um, to your regular exercise regimen in addition to the aerobic exercise. And then of course, if you are drinking alcohol and your blood pressure is up, you should really try to limit that. In, in some of my patients, we say, you know, minimal is, is best. Um, and even the recommended two drinks or less a day for some people might be too much. So I encourage you to do the exploration and understand, you know, how your body is responding um, to alcohol. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these. Um, I think most of um, the highlights here um, I, I talked about, we do get an, a lot of questions as to which medication should be started first. And it turns out in the guidelines, your doctor has a lot of freedom to choose the medication that they think is going to be right for you um, uh, based on you know, your allergies and your side effects. There's not one medication that's um, best for everyone. And depending on where your blood pressure is, in addition to these lifestyle changes, sometimes we have to start medications and sometimes people end up on more than one medication. So the average um, patient with high blood pressure actually ends up on three medications. Um, so uh, it's, it's not necessarily a failure on uh, an individual's part. It's just the nature of high blood pressure. And sometimes it, it does take a couple of medications to get those pressures under control. Okay, so I apologize that that had to be um, a little speedy at the end. I'm going to stop my screen share and um, and maybe we have a minute or two for for questions. Oops. Um, Allison, thank you. That was I lost my window. Sorry, I can't stop the share. There we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Perfect. So so many questions, and I this is. I know a lot of you are going to have to go at four, and it is a beautiful day, and you should get your exercise and, and sunshine. But uh, one question that has come up here that I haven't gotten to yet is um, that if you're doing all these things that are recommended and the blood pressure is still high, uh, is that a sign or a symptom of something else going on, and what else should we do? So I think, you know, as part of the workup, we, we do need to do some laboratory evaluation, a good physical exam, and sometimes an ultrasound of your heart. Um, uh, once all that has been done and your blood pressure is still high, you fall into that group that we say is essential hypertension, right? And there's probably a lot of little things and some genetic predisposition that has your blood pressure elevated. What we do know do know from studying thousands and thousands of people is lower is better, right? And you're gonna decrease your risk of stroke, you're gonna decrease your risk of heart attack, you're gonna decrease your risk of cognitive decline um, if we get your blood pressure at goal for a number of years. So it doesn't have to be perfect tomorrow, but you don't wanna sit around with your blood pressure running high for years. We wanna start a treatment plan, get you at goal. Um, and some of those slides I, I buzzed over at the end if, if your doctor's starting you on treatment, 
it shouldn't be, I'll see you next year, right? It's, I'm going to see you in 30 days. Let's see where your blood pressure is. Because quite commonly, we have to make a lot of little tinkers to get you on a good regimen. And then we can kind of release you back to that, um, those infrequent visits. Perfect. All right. It's four o'clock. I think I took too much time. I apologize. We squeezed out the hypertension, which is such an important topic. But if, you know, if there's interest in this, we can continue this conversation also in coming webinars. So I, I guess we'll wrap up here. If anyone wants to stick around and Sydney and Ellie, I'll ask you to save the chat and the questions so that we can have those to take a look at. I think there might have been a few that fell through the cracks. We had a, more than 100 people on today. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, thanks, Ellie and Sydney, for the behind the scenes. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Please fill out the evaluation and give us more ideas for, for future webinars. We really appreciate those. And that's how this happened. So more ideas are great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.